I think it was psychiatrists or psychologists or the only medical professionals that don't look at the organ they're treating. And that's, it is pretty shocking. The, f the fact that they don't bother looking at that most of the time and that's the thing they're treating and there's all these amazing tools and techniques. And I was wondering if you could speak on that and how that's affected the, your journey the last 10 plus years. Well, and they call me crazy. I'm sure. Yeah, you know, I've been in a war with my colleagues. Yeah. Uh, psychiatrists are indeed the only medical specialists that never look at the organ they treat. They make diagnoses based on symptom clusters with no biological data. Exactly how Abraham Lincoln was diagnosed with depression in 1840. And, and I'm not kidding when I say this. And it's part of the shit show that is psychiatry today. Last year, there were 337 million prescriptions for antidepressant medication, 60 million prescriptions for stimulants, most of those to children. And without no biological information, you know, you tell me you're depressed, I'll give, give you Lexapro. Lexapro. Um, and that's just nuts. Um, so my own personal journey, when I started looking at the brain, I was so excited. I was like a little child. I'm like, you know, I became a psychiatrist because my first wife tried to kill herself while I was in medical school and I was horrified uh, to her to see a wonderful psychiatrist. And I came to realize if he helped her, it wouldn't just help her, that ultimately it helped me help our children and even our grandchildren because they would be shaped by someone who was happier and more stable. So I fell in love with psychiatry. But before I went to medical school, I was an infantry medic. I was in the army and then I was an x-ray technician. And when I was an x-ray technician, our professors used to always say, how do you know unless you look? So as I became a psychiatrist, I'm like, well, why aren't we looking at the brain? I mean, obviously the brain is our organ. And so when I got the opportunity to do it, I'm really passionate about it. But then my colleague said, well, that's not what we do. That's not how you do this work. Well, I'm a middle child and I was sort of a pain in the butt to my dad. Um, and because you tell me I shouldn't do something, I'm like, well, why? You know, if I get more information, I'm going to be a better doctor. And so for the first couple of years, I was pretty anxious going against the grain. And then, and I think for many people to do something that's important, there's a story. Um, so I was really anxious and upset. I feel caught. I want to be loved by my colleagues. I wanted to be. And yet I wanted to do the work I knew I was supposed to do. And... Um, 1995, my sister-in-law calls me up one night and tells me my nine-year-old nephew, Andrew, who's also my godson, attacked a little girl on the baseball field that day for no particular reason. And I'm like, it's 10 o'clock on a Tuesday night. I'm on the phone. I'm horrified because Andrew is also my godson. So he and I are really close. And I'm like, Sherry, what else is going on with him? And she said, Danny, he's different. He's mean. He doesn't smile anymore. I went into his room, still makes me emotional. I went into his room today and I found two pictures that he had drawn. One of them, he was hanging from a tree in a suicide attempt. The other picture, he's shooting other children. So if you think about it now, Andrew is Columbine or Sandy Hook, or Parkland, Florida waiting to happen. And I'm like, I want to see him tomorrow. And because I'd already been scanning for four years, I'd already sort of associated violence to an area of the brain called the left temporal lobe. And uh, when I saw him, I'm like, buddy, what's going on? And he said, Uncle Danny, I don't know. I'm just mad all the time. I'm like, is anybody teasing you? I said, no. Is anybody touching you in places they shouldn't be touching you? No. Um, and so I scanned him. 
and I held his hand while he held his teddy bear while I got scanned. And it's the first time I saw it. I've seen it a hundred times since. He was missing his left temporal lobe, that area that's often associated with violence. It turned out he had a cyst the size of a golf ball occupying the space of his left temporal lobe. And when the neurosurgeon drained it, his behavior completely went back to normal. And it was at that moment the war in my head started with my colleagues. I, be, I stopped being afraid and became a warrior. Because if you don't look, you don't know. The neurosurgeon said, if I hadn't figured that out, Andrew would have been dead in six months. And this is personal, right? Not only from people in my own family who suffered, but I'm a better doctor when I look at your brain. And you're a better patient, <laughs> because when you look at your brain, you like go, oh, I want that better. Right. I mean, most rational people, they know your brain's involved in everything you do, how you think, how you feel, how you act, how you get along with other people. And, and if it's, it's troubled, you're, you're going to have trouble in your life. life. So if you see your brain and it's not healthy, you're more cooperative with me when we put you on a brain health program. So not a psychiatric treatment program. Nobody really wants that, but everybody wants a better brain. So I hate the term mental illness because it shames people, it's stigmatizing, and it's wrong. These are brain health issues. And so when we reimagine mental health as brain health, everything changes, which means you got to eat better and probably should supplement your brain. And you probably shouldn't let your children play tackle football or hit soccer balls with their head. So Jim Rickards has just recorded a video that's not available to anyone in the public. And he's going to be talking about how this upcoming recession is going to be fast. It's going to be bloody. It's going to be nasty. But at the same time, he's going to show you how you can position yourself to profit from all of this chaos. Now we've made this video only available to our viewers. Go to LondonReal.tv forward slash Jim. Watch that immediately. I can't say enough good things about Jim Rickards. He understands the global economic system better than any guest I've ever had on London Real. His predictions are almost uncannily true. And you can learn how to profit from his vision, from his expertise, and his understanding of economics. So go to LondonReal.tv forward slash Jim or click the link below. It's an excellent, excellent look on what's going to happen in the future and how you can position yourself to profit from that. Jim is one of the best in the business, one of my favorite guests on London Real, and he's very, very good at predicting the future and showing us all to profit from it. So click the link and I hope you enjoy. Hey, it's Brian Rose, founder of the DeFi Academy. I've told you my four-week crypto bootcamp is amazing, but don't take my word for it. This is what my students are saying. The DeFi Academy was an amazing experience for me. It took me totally out of my comfort zone. In this course, I was challenged. I was held accountable and pushed to do things that honestly weren't always easy. It's been phenomenal, and I can't believe uh, we're already up on our four weeks. It has flown by. Going through this DeFi accelerator, by far, was one of the best courses I've taken. You do this course, you really get into the nitty gritty of the activities that will make you comfortable with decentralized finance. Thank you so much to Brian and everyone at London Real and the DeFi Academy for even putting together an amazing course like this. Anybody else that wants to do it, please sign up. It is well worth the money.